Brandon Schlichter is the ultimate rags to riches story. As a child, he was evicted from his home. Instead of going to college, he got a job at a warehouse earning minimum wage, and for years, he was barely scraping by. However, over time, he was able to turn that experience into a multi-million dollar fortune. And now he owns and operates laundromats, rental real estate, vending machines, and even a car wash that generates a combined several million dollars a year. So today we're diving into exactly how he did it, the best side hustles that you could start to make money in 2023, and the reason realities of running several businesses on today's episode of Subscribe if you haven't done that already. Although before we go into that, we gotta thank our sponsor, StreamYard. Producing a video can be a very daunting task, especially for those who haven't done it yet before. Yeah, from the people I've spoken to, it's the editing and post-production process that discourages a lot of people the most, especially in the very beginning. But thankfully, StreamYard offers a comprehensive solution for live streaming production, enabling users to effortlessly transmit live videos to popular platforms such as YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. With StreamYard, you can easily create high-quality live streams with just a a few clicks and their easy to use interface makes it incredibly easy to get started. You can create your own custom backgrounds, add multiple cameras, and even add guests with just a few clicks. StreamYard also has powerful analytics tools that helps you understand just how well your live streams are performing. You're also able to see how many people are watching your live streams and which social media platforms are driving the most amount of traffic. Plus they integrate with popular streaming and analytics tools like OBS, Google Analytics, and YouTube Creator Studio. So feel free to try StreamYard for free today using the link down below in the description and you can get started creating professional looking live streams in minutes again the link is down below in the description it's completely it free thank you so much streamyard and let's get on with the episode it's free so welcome to the iced coffee hour brandon schlichter we are so excited to have you <laughs> also known as investment joy and you put out some incredible content you i've do. been watching for a very very long time thank you for coming well thank you for having me here it was just by absolute random happenstance that i ended up here because yeah, we got to tell you what happened. Yeah, so I went crazy. to uh, Sushi Neko in Las Vegas for all you could eat sushi last night. And I walk in and guess who's there? You're kidding. No. that It was by that coincidence. Yes. Really? Because yeah. he asked me, he was like, hey, what's that sushi spot? I'm in Vegas. Yeah. Where am I supposed to go? Is it, It's called Super Sushi, right? And I'm like, yeah, Super Sushi is great. But recently we've been going to Sushi Neko. So you should try that spot out. He's like, okay, I'll go there instead. And he went there. And then you went that oh, same night. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, we walked in. You had just sat down. Yeah. And, uh, and now we're here, yep. but he told me, he told me that he texted you, Jack, and, uh, to let, to let, uh, me know that he was in town and you didn't let me know. Did you say that exactly? Yeah. I that said, I, I said, I'm in town. <laughs> if you and Graham have time, let's hang out. Or you want to go to get dinner? Let's go get dinner, whatever. And, uh, you were on a, I, well, I thought you had left the state already and you're, you're Mr. Important. you I'm not, I'm, I'm just bad at getting, don't you have Graham's number? You have his number. So I right? do, yeah. but I, said, I, I feel like, here's the thing with, with Graham, I feel like you were, have been the filter for Graham and I should go to, no, you know, go, go you. straight to Graham. No, yeah. Yeah. Graham's Jack's better yeah. getting, it's, it's sad. Filter. Yeah. He's getting really bad. Yeah. I don't know what he's doing. Half the yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, anyways, guys, let's redirect <laughs> okay. this conversation right back <laughs> yeah. to our guest. Okay. How much in real estate do you own at the moment? Um, like straight real estate. If. If we wouldn't assign like any value to my businesses, it's probably six, seven million dollars ish. Six, seven million dollars. And what, yeah. what age are you? How old are you? Uh, 37. 37. That's pretty good. Yeah. But and what makes it unique though is I think the laundromats. Yeah. I absolutely love your TikToks and your shorts where you go through and you, you go through the laundromat and you collect the change and then you add up how much you made that day. There's something about it that I find incredibly interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where I'm just trying to show people my life. Like, oh, Brandon does these things. This is how much I make. I'm really trying to be transparent and mm -hmm. honest with people because it's like, um, I, I have great days. It's like before I got on the airplane because I'm trying to get out of the mode of me being the guy that does most of the work. And um, since the last time I was on the show, I've hired a lot of people, um, but I'm not there yet. I'm down yeah. like last time I was like at four or five hours a week. Now I'm down to one or two hours a week at the laundromat and I'm trying to get just stop like do my videos there show the revenue numbers and then go on to something bigger. I'm trying to do bigger things, more profitable things because I, I've been like, one of the weird things is I've been recording like everything I've done in business since mm -hmm. 2013. So I can go on my photo roll on Android and like, oh, here's the house we're fixing floors on, you know, almost 10 years ago, this right. And it's just like, I want people to see progress in what I'm doing, but I also want to be honest. So like right before I got on that airplane, I, I, we pulled like twenty six, twenty seven hundred dollars out of the laundromat. It's like, oh, gosh, this would be a good video. Man, look at this big, I mean, the stack of bills is this tall. It's like, I went back and watched one of my first videos and it was, I had $148 in quarters in the first collection back in uh, July, 2019. And now it was 
26 wow. or so most yeah. of what you do, do now yeah. with the laundromat you just go in and collect money because that's Pretty what much. i'm seeing like everywhere on social media yes. like tens of millions of views you just going in taking mm -hmm. out the quarters collecting it it's just some absurd amount of Tell dollar us, bills is it really that easy my thinking Absolutely is not. if it's that easy everyone's gonna do it yes and it's like for if you were an established investor if yeah. you someone of your caliber or jack's caliber or alex's caliber it, it really, you, it's, it would be that easy. You guys understand business. You understand money and finance. You've got some level of um, money. So you, any of the problems that would come up, you yeah. can pay for systems, you can pay out for automations, you can pay for people to do the work for you, you could hire a competent manager operator and then you do whatever you want. And that's where I'm really trying to be. But mm. I've gone from 2019, I had like two employees, two people working for me, in between YouTube and all these other businesses, we probably, gosh, I got probably 40 people working for me at this point. 40? Uh, probably at this point, yeah, it just keeps getting more and more. And I, I keep wanting to hire more people. How are you able to afford 40 employees? Um, you, YouTube blessed me in 2022. Um, my channel revenue was up pretty good. Um, the, my real estate company did about 1.3, 1.4 million in, um, sales. We sold some, dump, some houses. I'm trying to reposition my portfolio, sell off all my really low end stuff and just go up to mid to high class. I'm mm -hmm. still staying in Ohio, still in the same two counties that I've been in. Just trying to change some things in my business. Cause I, I feel like I've documented every disaster in low-end housing that you could. I've dealt with drugs, I've dealt with violence, I've dealt with rats crawling out of trash bags, just everything, and I'm like, okay, this has been my life to this point, but what's it look like as an investor and a business owner as I transition and I get rid of that portfolio, um, I'm gonna go negotiating a deal on my 28 worst, and the offer that came in, gosh, right before I came to Vegas, it's like 1.04, 1.05 million dollars, which is nothing here in Vegas, but I probably have 300,000 in that. Mm. So my portfolio is almost tripled. And I was like, well, if I can get my headache, I can alleviate these headaches with these low end rentals. Um, I've got an option feeler out. I might finance part of the portfolio, mm -hmm. take a bunch of money, a decent bit of money up front, finance a large portion of that 1.05, at current interest rates, um, I offer, I think, 8.5% to a potential buyer. And I was like, okay. So I, I take off my headaches, I put a big lump of cash in my pocket, and then I go on, I start acquiring better places. Because we just, we just finished up this beautiful Victorian house downtown. I'll rent it probably to a doctor or a lawyer. And that's a different clientele that I've dealt with. Sure. Uh, for the most part. I've got those people now. I've always had those people. But I, they don't make good YouTube videos. And I've never been able to like figure out how do I script this as time goes on. It's easy to script. It's easy to tell a story about you know the sing the single mom that you're working with and who's looking for affordable housing. And here's I help them out their way. I've put out a lot of stories about that on you know long format, short format content. And now it's like okay, I think I'm at a point where I can tell the story about myself and these properties a little bit better. So now we're transitioning on to bigger and better things. Mm. Let's talk about, because what you've built is pretty incredible. Like between the YouTube channel, the real estate portfolio, the laundromat businesses, all of the businesses that you own. Can we talk about where you started and how you were able to acquire this amount of like assets and businesses? How far do you wanna go back? What's, what sparked off the journey? Being like, poor. Okay, let's start there. <laughs> I, grew, I grew up poor. Uh, sure. My dad was a truck driver. Uh, my mom sold Avon. We were evicted twice growing up. Um, that was pretty hard. Um, when my dad had a heart attack when I was 18 years old, so I had to go work at a warehouse. And um, I, when I was 15, I was really big into the sport of paintball. I you guys have ever played it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, that's, especially back then, it's cheaper now. I really want to get back into it because it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I, number one, I have the money. And it's also like a, th a third of the cost, a quarter of the cost. Mm. So I was like, this is really cool. I want to do this, but how do you make any money for it? And it's like, well, I can't get a job at 15 years old, but I could start an online store. So my brother and I started like essentially an online pawn shop. And we sold, bought and sold people's paintball guns. And we got to the point we were we were buying, selling, trading, making 40 bucks an hour at 15 years old. Were you flipping? Like yeah. fixing up? Buying, fit, yeah. Buying... Buying, fit, flipping, fixing. And mm. like, I have no mechanical knowledge. No one in my immediate family was mechanically inclined, but my brother and I were just like, we couldn't read a manual, fix things. So we did at that time making 40 bucks an hour, but I had no understanding of finances, like nothing. I like, I'm a, I was a D average student in, as far as um, 
algebra goes. And algebra is really critical to business. You need to know how to calculate numbers together. You need to know how they correlate. And I didn't realize at 15 years old, I was fixing paintball guns, making 40 bucks an hour. It wasn't fun. But if I knew that I was making that much money, I would have probably, I would have had a million dollar company at 50, probably 17 years old mm. before my dad's heart attack, which that would have been life changing for me at that point if I had gone that way, but I did. So then my brother and I got into this mobile paintball business thing where we would go and take a trailer full of paintball equipment to a church facility or a youth camp or whatever. And hey, you can rent all my paintball equipment for $1,500, $2,000. I mean, minimum wage. It's like you you guys critically review, view the businesses that you do and you, you can figure out how much money am I making per hour? Is this the most optimal way for me to make the money? And I did, I was making three bucks an hour doing the thing that was fun, but I, I we just totally threw away the business that was making money. You weren't able to recognize that discrepancy? Nope. Between income? No. I, I mean, what happens when you don't track your profit expenses? You just look, is there money in the account? Yes or no. So you just found something else that you enjoyed doing a lot more and you we, went that route because yeah. it was still money. Mm. Yeah, because it was good money. You know, 16, 17 years old, we got my driver's license and we were towing a truck around Southern Ohio and Michigan. At that point, we just never thought about it because, oh, it's yeah. fun. Life's great. You know, got up to 17, 18 years old, started thinking, well, you know, we're not really making much money here. Maybe we should do something. No, we're super passionate about this. You know, passion will cover us through. Dad had a heart attack. And then I had to go work at the warehouse. I was like, oh, crap, that dream's over today. Like, that's this summer was the summer of 03. Mm. Um, that dream's over. <laughs> and I got to go into something what else. What were you doing in a warehouse? Uh, I was packing people's clothes for the gap. It's a distribution facility. Mm -hmm. So that's why I will never say anything bad ever to anybody that works at a warehouse like Amazon. That's exactly what I did was I was getting making eleven twenty five an hour packing people's underwear and clothes. Um, at one point I did start running a forklift. So that was, that was, mm -hmm. I loved driving a forklift. Yeah. So it was fun, but I, I, you know, I knew at that point I'd do something else. It's like, I can't make 11, 25 an hour. I want to get married. We would love to have kids someday. You know, I was 18 years, 19 years old, thinking about the future. You can't do that at 11 bucks an hour. It's like, what could, what I do? What can I do in Southern Ohio? I have no college education. I don't know anything. Like what, where do I go? So it's like, you know, everybody in town that's in real estate seems to be driving a Cadillac. They've got a suit on. And uh, I thought those are the rich people. So I got my real estate license, put uh, my Hondros college thing. I was in real estate school for three weeks, put 1350 on a credit card. Like, I'll get my real estate license. And I did. And it, uh, it wasn't great early on, but the where my life split apart and I went on a different path from understanding my profit and law sheet for mm -hmm. my paintball business, I went another route and I started being around people who were wealthy. I'd never been around anybody that, ever talked about money and said, oh, I actually have money. And like the first, within two years of me being real estate, I met a truck driver, just like my dad, who drove for GM out of Columbus. Uh, he was buying and flipping houses with cash in 06, so before the bubble burst. He was flipping houses with cash, and I was like, how can you afford this? And he said, well, I got an investing. I took my money coming in from driving a truck, and I invested it. And that built up cash reserves. And I decided after a while, I'm going to tap into my cash reserves and we'll flip some houses. And he started flipping some houses and they made money and they made mm. more money. How do you do this? And then I met another guy that was a janitor and he bought some houses in one of the worst neighborhoods of Columbus, Ohio for cash, bought them for like 10 or 20 grand back in 03 or 04. Neighborhood got better. He improved the location, sold them for a couple hundred thousand dollars a piece. And he's like, I want, to, I want you to find me a house with a pool. Gosh, you're a janitor and you're having hiring me as a real estate agent to, to find a house with a pool for you? It was just mind-blowing. These people were just like the people I grew up with, but they all had money. I was like, okay, this is what I got to do. And I didn't have any broke investors coming to me, but I had broke real estate agents in the office. Guys, we had a really sweet couple, but they were crying one time that their social security letter only increased half a percent that year. Wow. Yeah, and I was like, oh, you've been in real estate. For, they were in real estate at that point by, for 40 years. 40? 40 years. years. And they had the plaques on their wall. They have one on like the MGM or something here in Vegas. And they were overlooking the strip. And they had their, you know, uh, Columbus Board of Realtors jackets on, $10 million award winner. And oh they got God. these plaques of when they hit $50 million in gross sales in 1990. I'm like, gosh, so what, hap what, what happened? They, they gambled, spent, Yikes. they spent every dime they had. And I'm like, these people are in this real estate, illustrious real estate business, multi-millionaire, not multi-millionaire, multi-million dollar producing agents. And 
they didn't do anything with it. And at that point, I had kind of developed a really mentor mentee relationship with a guy that was a, a CEO of an oil company. Mm-hmm. He took me and his son, he's like, God, he's like, Brandon, unless you really start learning about money and finance and running a business and taking care of yourself, he's like, that's going to be you. So he was a CEO of an oil company? Yeah. How do you just casually run into a CEO of an oil company? Like, that's uh, got to be like a pretty big it fish, is. Right? He, re- he retired. He retired as the CEO of this oil company and they dealt with a lot of real estate acquisitions. At one time, they owned the most subways in Southern Ohio. Hmm. They owned set, oh, sorry, 25 or 26 uh, either sit-go or 76 gas stations. And he had to work with commercial real estate agents. He worked with franchise operations because they bought... they. They put subways in every gas station they had back in the 90s, and they just printed cash. And uh, he got out, and he said, you know, all... You, do you have your license still? Uh, no, I don't. No. Not in I California. apologize to yeah. if this is not edited out of the conversation. <laughs> he said, those real estate agents are the laziest, stupidest people I've ever met. I wonder if I can do better than they can. And so at 70 years old, he got a real estate license, and he beat the heck out of everybody in the what? office. Yeah. He was top 10 agent in my county in like two years after getting a license. And he just was like, he was always talking about stuff. And granted, I was the youngest agent in the office, mm-hmm. like the youngest full time. Sure. There were a couple part time agents and they just knew whatever saw him. But I was in the office every day, taking floor time, doing cold calls. And I don't know, he admired my hustle and he just really started talking to me a lot about what I needed to do. And he was always encouraging me, get, get into rentals. He's like, it's hard to lose with rentals. He's like, I'd love to see you get a brokerage license someday. And I never did that because in the state of Ohio, you have to have a college degree for mm-hmm. it. And never, never, never. Really can't happened. you get around that with uh, experience? They say you can, but I've tried asking guys at the high division real estate. And they're like, hell, oh, you got to have a, make a really strong case for us. By the time I was like really going down that path, it was after I got into investing. And once I got into real estate, investing was over. It was like, why, why bother? I buy First house I bought, I bought it for twenty three thousand dollars. It's full of mold. We fixed the mold problem. Put twenty five thousand in it. It booked it. Gosh, hundred twenty five, hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I, 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 I um, doubled, if not tripled, the value we had in the first house I bought in twenty thirteen. How old were you? Twenty six, twenty seven. You're twenty six, twenty seven. How much money you were making as a real estate agent? This is after I, I, I was. Gosh, I was only making ten thousand dollars a year as a real estate agent then because I had started buying and selling websites and flipping them when I got into full time real estate investment. Mm-hmm. So, how much were you making just in general from active income? Active income from real estate at the time, or no, as just an agent? In general, period? As, oh gosh, at that point, that year was a. I had a really bad stretch from mm-hmm. oh. 2010 to 2012. It's a terrible year for real estate agents. It was, yeah, I wasn't making anything in real estate. I was doing a lot of BPOs, bank, uh, I'm sorry, broker price opinions for foreclosures. Mm-hmm. So I was in, I figured out between 2010 and 2012, I did 1,400 BPOs for banks. Wow. Yeah. So. And how did that, did they just pay you per, per each house. one? Yeah, per how, house. Was, how much was that? Uh, $45 to $75. So for those that don't know, basically what that is, is when a bank wants to list a property that they own, that they did a foreclosure on, they'll go to the broker and they'll pay for a broker price opinion. And they'll just get a whole bunch of those and then say, okay, well, based on these five brokers, the average comes in at $100,000 and therefore we'll list our home at 98. And they just make sure, because the banks aren't going and like finding... People in each, you know, the banks aren't really going. They wouldn't doing go to an appraiser. Like, nope. No. no, they just go to the actual no. appraiser yeah. because the average appraisal is going to be five hundred bucks in Ohio, and yeah. they can get a real, they can get a guy starving oh, okay. <laughs> for fifty yeah. bucks. And they could, get, yeah, they could basically get ten opinions for the price of one. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And also, the brokers had a better pulse of the market because appraisers yeah. will look at past sales, yes. and at that time every sale was lower than the previous. Yeah. So you couldn't look at past data. You have to look at like what's on the market, yeah. what's actually selling, how many buyers are interested. A broker is going to give you, I think, one of the most honest opinions out there. Yep. If, if they truly have no skin in the game. Yeah, and that's what I did for about two years there. Started building some websites in the background. That started making me more money. So 2013-ish came around. I was like, gosh, dang it. I need to get in like investing. Because I all the investors like I had, I dealt with were doing great numbers. So I built a chain of websites and sold them off for one year worth of revenue. So I was doing like 50,000 as a take home pay, but building websites, selling, mm-hmm. selling content on them and whatnot. And uh, sold that the websites I developed for 50 grand, which is one year worth of revenue. And uh, it was like, uh, you know, I'm gonna go out and take $25,000. I am going to find a house to buy. I started mentioning to people online. It's like, I'm gonna do this because I'm in Ohio. And just like a lot of people started saying, well, we'll you want some money? 
give you some money. I got some money for you if you want to buy some house with me. Okay. I should never thought of that. I never thought about actually ever asking somebody for money. And it's just like I bought that first house, po started posting about it on forums and stuff. And they went nuts. And they're like, okay, how much money do you need? And I started talking to people online. At that, that specific point, they had just all become, a lot of them become overnight rich with Bitcoin. Mm. And they had li they were liquidating their, their, their Bitcoin after it hit 100. <laughs> and uh, Dollars? Said, $100 of Bitcoin. This is back in the day. This is 2013. Wow. And they, they, they'd sold their Bitcoin. They're like, we got to put it in something stable, something with some real upside, Brandon. It's like, ah, go buy some dummy houses with me in Southern Ohio. So they did. And I just like, boom, I had $400,000 in a fundraise. 400000 so yeah, How wow. do you go and get that big of a reputation to get $400,000 from nothing? Was it just your networking as a real estate agent and people just trusted your opinion? Well, social media. Back. I mean, you look at YouTube and, and, and Facebook and TikTok and stuff and we've got, oh, we got this video content. 2012, 2013 and before is web forums. You post on a web forum. You're like, oh, gosh. No, here's a house I bought for 50 bought and fixed up for $50,000. And now we're bringing a thousand dollars a month worth of rent off of it. Plus um, it's, I could sell it tomorrow for 125. You get attention from people and you know, they just start throwing money at you. And that's like, you know, w w anybody in the social media creator space and you guys have creators on all the time, you could pitch a, a wood coaster, say, Oh, I got a, Got my OnlyFans logo on the coaster here, and I, we sell a thousand of them overnight. And it's just the internet was smaller back then, but it wasn't in it, structural wise, it wasn't any different. Mm. So, this got into investing, and it got to the point around 2017. I was just like, you know, why even bother, guys? I'm like, it, it was so easy for me to go out and get a deal. I'm like, I'm gonna start doing fun deals. So, started running into laundromats. Like, oh, that I should buy one of those. And then, what sparked the laundromat? I, uh, the, it's the, it's the one that I do all the videos on the one in Chillicothe. And, um, I ran in a buddy of mine said, Hey, we got to look at this laundromat. You want to ever see how much money they make? And so we met this older lady. Um, uh, and I, I talk about her on my channel a lot. Her son died. He owned the laundromat and he had, that's the only job I think he had. He operated the laundromat, owned it since 1983. He passed away in 2015, 2016. And, um, she was telling me that, and uh, this buddy that came along that she had operated the, the, the son's laundromat. She couldn't run the business because they were doing $8,000 a month in quarters and it was just too heavy physically. Oh my gosh. And I was like, what the crap? And you know, I'm a real estate guy. I'm like, this is a $60,000 building. It was a dump. And I was like, $8,000 a month in a dumpy location and there's apartments. And I was like, I have to buy this business. So we, we offered the lady uh, 60 grand for it. And she turned us down and she accepted some other guy's offer. Well, long story short, the some other guy ended up giving it to, I, f I found this out on my, and I think mm -hmm. we did YouTube videos about it. He ended up giving the business to his like 14 year old son as a, a fun summer project. And you know, no offense, 14 year olds, if you're watching this, it's you, you, you can't run a laundromat unless you oh super gosh. hustle. So they end up having homeless problem, drug problems, equipment breaking down. It's like, you know, you have a 14 year old kid and he got his mom help trying to help him. It's like, it's just, it didn't work. So they closed it down. It was empty for a couple of years. And I negotiated a seller finance deal with a new guy. I was like, just, just give it to me. So I started getting in just creative deals just for fun. I've done, I did. Starting getting into master leasing homes. Okay, you guys. Now, was that laundromat the first one you did? What now, was the I, first laundromat? I, I, that you the bought? first laundromat with these two absolute dogs that I finally got rid of. Um, so I, I ran into that laundromat that was making eight thousand dollars a month. I have to be in the laundry industry. I have to get in the laundromat industry. And this guy contacted me because he was a part of our investor association. He said, "I've got two laundromats. You have to buy them." We like. We, he was like, "I was making five thousand dollars a month on two locations before we closed them down." I was like, oh gosh, I'll go. Buy, I'll go. I'll go pay cash for them right now. So I paid him like forty or fifty grand for these two locations, and they were in worse areas than the one I looked at, and the one under the bridge. So if you guys watch me on YouTube, I, I'll refer to as the lawn man under the bridge. We went in there and turned the electric on just to do our due diligence phase. Like an idiot, I bought him without, I bought that those locations without an inspection. Idiot move. Now, what do you inspect? Is it the machines? Machine, the machines. Roof building or no? You do the normal real estate stuff. Okay. And then you test the equipment, you test the infrastructure. Like the do the drains all drain? Do the, does the electric work work? Does the electric work really well? all this different stuff. And we looked in the basement, there was old um, panel, 
just an old electric panel in there and uh we didn't think much of it and i and the lights were on and i didn't call my crew in to do the inspection i just did it myself idiot move and uh we got in there after buying it we flipped on the one breaker oh none of the washers and dryers are powered we flip on the other breaker and it's a 240 volt line it was like 240 volt 60 amp 100 amp it was way more and the whole line exploded mm-hmm. almost burn it down wow yeah those are pre-youtube days that would have been a really fun video um they just it caused so much damage in there we never got it up and running um, so you lost how uh, much money on that? Oh gosh, 30,000, 40,000. It sucks. Okay. But yeah. But, um, no, the seller, were they aware of these things? Yeah. And, you and know, it was now, but then it falls on you for just not yeah, doing your answer. But every, no, isn't that disclosed yeah. in, the, in the seller disclosure? No. Commercial real estate in the state of Ohio does not require a seller disclosure statement. So they could just say, well, I don't yeah. know. It's not in the form, so yeah. I'm not responsible. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be worth though arguing that they should have known about that as a business it, owner? Yeah, it, I, I, it would be, but um, I'm in small town Ohio, and I'm willing to eat forty thousand dollars on a bad deal to maintain a relationship with somebody, especially since they're in our investor association. I felt like I had been transparent about everything, and everybody saw that I got screwed over. And I don't think anybody's ever done business with that guy again. So mm-hmm. you can't, you can't uh, was it get blood from a turnip? Is sure. that the statement? Blood from a stone. Yeah. yeah. It's like he, he we had to go negotiate a, sh- a short sale on those properties. And he was in a f- dire financial situation. So really, what what am I going to get from the guy? Go take his car? Yeah, no, go okay, that's true. Yeah. No. So it is what it is. I learned, sadly, a lot. But, but why jump in? Why buy another one? Wouldn't that discourage you and say, wow, yeah, you know, bad business? It, well, I yeah, and I had a lot of, I've had a lot of people really question my sanity at yeah. that point. But the problem was I had seen the income from the one that I have in the laundromat. I'm like, gosh, dang it. That one was making money. I know it. I saw two five gallon buckets worth of quarters up in that, the, the upper you know, the bedroom up there. I'm like, I know that place makes money. And uh, I did more due diligence. I actually looked at their water reports and made sure they had no, nominal water usage for the revenue amounts. Because that's one like dirty little secret. You go and you ask for the seller to give you a water statement, and you figure out their sale their water usage so i did did a lot more due diligence on that was okay it's it actually makes money here's the revenue numbers before they close down so i felt pretty confident going into it and it's been pretty good we're ever since i put new machines in it just keeps going up and up and up and up and um we're doing uh, getting ready to do commercial laundry drop off um i got got a contract with the largest airbnb guy in southern ohio and um we're on a very Defined pathway to be doing probably fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars a month off the the laundromat location. How much of that is profit? Um, so off the coin op laundry, it's a much higher margin business mm-hmm. than um, than uh, coin op. I, I figure the coin op will get ten thousand dollars, eight to ten thousand dollars a month. The net on that's going to be like you, you know standard standard rules on margins like forty percent net. So forty percent of like thirty five hundred ish, three thousand off the coin op side. My, you have got you've got like a twenty percent margin on the laundry drop offs. So that's gonna be another two thousand bucks. So it'll be like fifty five hundred, six thousand dollars. But the thing is, laundry drop offs much easier to scale because then yep. you get somebody in sales. Interesting like enough, I uh, I was talking to Cody Sanchez when she came to Ohio real recently, and we I was asking her to break her laundromat numbers down because I'd never seen her and break them down and I found out really quickly that she makes a killing off laundry drop off. Mm-hmm. But then her her high performers were on the West Coast, which was interesting. But I've run into some West Coast guys that were clearing a hundred thousand dollars a month off laundry drop off. Really? Yeah, yeah, they go to people's homes and they pick up their laundry and they deliver it. It's pretty cool. Really neat. We should up. get into that business, Jack. The laundromat drop off. Yeah. Yeah. Excusing Jeez. myself from that. I do not yeah. want to get in the laundry drop off, Graham. Do really? you actually want to do Imagine that? We have the we call it the laundromat hour. Graham, it's just like one so hour cool. and you just This guy it. I'm the exact same as Graham, unfortunately. It's like you run and you stay in your own lane and you you have these businesses that you're always running and then you get presented with this idea and that you just want to jump on it. Rain. You're just that like, so Oh, good. I can make so much money yeah. and it won't be that like active of income source. Yeah. Like you just want to jump on it, but the thing is, like you can, it's so easy to like constantly be biting off yeah, way but more than you Brandon's can. Brandon's working four hours a week here. Yeah, on the laundromat. With the laundromat. How many laundromats do you currently own? It's just the one. Just I'm one? looking. I'm trying to. I'm trying. I'm kind of like in the background negotiating three right now. 
I'm trying to figure out how do I get more of them because I love my laundromat. I love laundromats, period. Um, I had the opportunity re- were recently to talk to the president of the Coin Laundry Association, and he was a really, really cool guy. Um, and he's like, you're making my stupid phone ring off the hook because of your TikToks and stuff. I was like, oh, that's cool. And I, I mentioned, I was like, I've, I know I've heard that the, the, the pri- resale price has gone up a lot due to social media. Yeah, the, the, the so mul- it's more expensive yeah. to get into it? So you're probably indirectly responsible for the cost I, of all laundromats across the country. I was in told price. in a no certain terms by some big people that it, me and Cody Sanchez have raised the cost of laundromats at resale on biz by sell and the other platforms like uh, LoopNet and whatnot, like 25%. I was about to say, yeah. yeah. So I've got people that are act, trying to acquire them, um, like PE type people, and they've, they, they're really angry at me. And I was like, well, at least for the operators, again, and higher multiple on their sales. Yeah. So I'm like, wow. Because you're making it exciting and like sexy to, and yeah. cool yeah. to own a laundromat. I think before I looked into the laundromat business in 2013, and I decided against it because of how much work it was to go down to the laundromat, fixing machines. But the the ROI was really high. And the, yeah. the stores that I w- were, was looking at were anywhere between 150 to 300 grand in mm-hmm. West Los Angeles. Yeah. And the biggest issue that I saw was that rents were really high. It is. And yeah. I was so terrified of the rents going up in price. Yeah. And eventually paying a price, it's just like you'll... You can't operate. You can't stay in business. Yeah, I, I've got a couple people in West LA right now mm-hmm. that I'm helping with. I'm you know, doing some training and coaching with them, and that's that's always the killer with laundromats. Mm-hmm. Is you get in um, these poor, poor. I feel so bad for them. These non financially astute laundromat people when they get in and they buy themselves a job, mm-hmm. and that's the last thing anybody needs to do is buy themselves a laundromat job. I mean, we talk about laundry drop off. You know, for the iced coffee hour, you could fold clothes for your your drop off business. You could do that right here. Yeah, yeah, you could do that right here. You can make right all your guests fold your laundry, yeah. so you can up up increase that twenty percent margin just a little bit. But uh, they these un, un uh, astute people, they go in, they buy themselves a job. Their landlords increasing the rent rate. Mm-hmm. Some of those are on three point five or four percent escalation a year. Yep. And it just you know the compounding interest. And if their utility rates are going up, a lot of these people they don't increase their price on their customers enough, quick enough, and they just go bankrupt. It sucks. Mm-hmm. But then when there's someone closing down due to distress, there's always an opportunity. <clears throat> a lot of my laundry, a lot of my real estate portfolio was acquired post real estate crash as the the values had hit the lowest level of the trough and i know a lot of people over coronavirus just made all the money in the world off real estate that was bought because of somebody else's distressed asset mm. so it's like you know whenever there's a problem there's always a, a silver lining and yeah. for new investors to take over and someone with some real estate knowledge i think goes in and gets a laundromat then it ends up being a situation where um if they just get some knowledge in their head they can go and Negotiate with the landlord. So when you work four hours a week on that, how do you spend that four hours? I did. I'm down an hour or two. Um, it was just going in, refilling coins, refilling, making sure the floors were swept, sometimes stocking my vending machines, just doing a once around. I'm trying to get away from that as quickly as possible. I know it's going to kill my watchers, but we're probably going to start taking credit cards really soon. Just because I'm at a point with the business, if I don't go in and empty those quarters, mm-hmm. which I, I love it, you know, Everybody's like, oh, he's a kid, child at heart, wearing the ducktail shirt. I'm like, I love the quarters, but uh, Thursday, uh, last Thursday, my bucket with quarters was seventy five pounds, and I have to lift it over my shoulder. It's to good workout. Oh, it's great. Check, you know, it does. But then if someone comes in and I have that bucket on my shoulders and I twist around to see, you know, they have a ski mask on and do they look really shady, or is it someone with a smile on their face and big basket of colors? I, I have twisted my back more than once with that 75 now, pound bucket. Why not just do multiple buckets instead of one seventy five, just do two at you know 37 pounds. I, I, that would require some planning. Really? Yeah. That would require planning. I'd have to bring two buckets with me. But why don't you do that? I don't know. That makes it harder, Graham. Why? This guy wants to work well, less, not more. Really? It's because I'm trying to lift and manage one bucket with a phone in my hand or do something silly for YouTube. But the thing uh, is like, so you guys tell me I'm wrong here. I'm content. I'll do, we'll do a cons- consultation right now. Is it going to be worth 
the effort for me to have multiple buckets in a video or is one going to be enough? I think multiple buckets makes it yeah, seem like more. Okay, makes crap. It seem like more. You yeah. just got to get multiple buckets like the ones that you've seen where it's like a bucket and then there's a secret shelf oh, halfway up. Jack, always oh. scheming, Jack. I'm not always scheming. I'm Man, just, he, he asked for a big fast one. consultation. I'm just I saying, did. You know, and then that got, then uh, viral immediately. I got my money's worth here. So I think I, I'm still a little confused about the real inflection point for you between like being, you know, impoverished or whatever yeah. and struggling with money to the point where you're like, you're fine with money. I mean, you said you started building websites, you were I'm doing real estate, with, but I'm still not fine with money. <laughs> We've talked about this, right? The, 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 the mentality, the scarcity mentality that. No. Get out of here with that scarcity. I'm mentality. just saying Everyone because I've, I've noticed mentality. you have it too. And I think we've talked about this before, yeah. actually, you and I, yeah. how you still feel like, you know, you could go back to where you once Absolutely. were. Absolutely. Why do you feel that way? I don't know. I still have like nightmares on that. Like when I, I like, uh, this is weird. Uh, like when I get on my YouTube stats and like I've had a really bad day and I'm like not making any money or some something's happened in the company. I'm like, oh, crap, I'm writing a $10,000 check for this stupid thing, man. I'll have like a nightmare. They have to go. I'm back in the warehouse. I, it's just I, some psychological silly thing. I'm not, not not that my life's bad or anything. It's just I notice I do, still do a lot of silly little things. And it's like, I don't know why I do that. And I, what will it take for you to finally feel comfortable with fi like finances? When I build my time machine, I figure it out. I'll let you know. You think it's a number that like a net Doubt worth it. number? I, I, I think I really want to build a house. That's like my big thing that I'm working towards. I want to build a house like my dream house. And I think that maybe I do that. And have that in cash. And no have that in cash. I'm going to put in a trust. Mm -hmm. And then that way no one can lean against me. No one can do that. I think I'll be fine. I think that that's it. But obviously like when you got to the point of having like a net worth of like 500,000 or a million dollars, something you're pretty good for the most part, especially being in so. Southern Ohio. You think so? And what could go wrong? Let's start there. I what do you think could happen? Because uh, laundromats could be lawsuit heavy, can't they? They can be. Yeah. Some the laundromat could burn down with people inside of it. And the court would say, oh, that door was blah, 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 blah. You know, we're going to go after you a million dollars. And I've got, I ha carry heavy duty and Charles on everything I do. Like my laundromats and car washes are three million, four million aggregate. So each 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 one of those is like two million plus my umbrella on top is another two. So you're like five, four million aggregate. And the but the problem is it burns down with a couple of people and then you felt held liable. Um, that's the wipeout insurance. So then they go to the LLC. Well, what and the LLC should provide protection, but what if they can pierce my corporate veil and yeah. they determine that I have? Well, that's not, why you have to have insurance on the LLC as well. I, and I yeah. do well. Yeah. Yeah, th that's in my four million aggregate. Okay, but they could wipe out. You could have. You could be found negligent in something, and it would make. Mm -hmm. Ohio's not that litigious, but I w worry about the worst. So they could, you know, ten million dollars. Oh gosh, then they wipe out all these different things, and I've got equity in some of my LLCs, and then I'm a sole proprietor on other ones, and then some have debt with banks. I'm purely debt free. It's a mix, and I've tried to do a little bit of every kind of real estate deal. I got businesses and real estate, and I got these laundromats and I got the YouTube channel and I got all just all sorts of different things. And I'm just trying to build money pockets all over the place. And in the hope that I'll feel better about it, I'm, like, yeah, I'm still not there yet. But that point where you finally did, like I said, hit those milestones of like 500,000 or a million mm -hmm. or something like that. What was the actual catalyst for you to achieve that goal? Because I want to know for the people listening right now, okay, yeah. what they could do. Like maybe sure it didn't the, still feel like a lot to you, but I'm sure oh, for someone listening, they're like, they're like, man, the, how do I do that? How the, did Brandon do that? Uh, the, it was, it was buying the first rental property. That was the it first was thing. At, yeah, it was at, I felt so good after I bought the first thing because I, I knew I got the money to buy a place that would make me money. I'm like, I can do this again. Because you always hear the first one's always the hardest. The first rental is the hardest. As a real estate agent, the first deal is the hardest. It's always the hardest one. And like, if I was to give advice for everybody, it's it's no different than you guys. Should. I'm, I've, I had people, I don't know how many people this week I've had asked, you need to f try, you need to do whatever it takes to learn about house hacking. You need to find a place with an FHA loan. You need to get that. And for me, if I was starting all over again, or I was at 18 years ago, and I'm like, two camera guys out there, they're a 21, 22. I'm like, you have to house hack. And one of them is. They bought a condo in Myrtle Beach, and mm. I'm like super proud of him. And um, Noah, the other one that's out there somewhere, um, he's he. we were talking about duplex. He's like, I, f I found duplexes and these different things. That's like, that would be my thing that I would recommend everybody do. And I'm not saying... I guess I should say, I'm, I don't, th I'm not telling you, you have to do this, but I think that is the easiest thing for anybody to do out there because 
three and a half percent down. Um, you don't have to have a super insane credit score to get it. I think it's going to be approachable for a lot of people. Not the only thing you can do. There's a lot of other things you can do, but I think it's the easiest hanging fruit. So basically find a property that you know you'll be able to afford. And mm -hmm. if you need to move in other people to support yeah. the income or the, the, the expense of having the property. Yes. Hmm. I think it's a wonderful thing. And for you, that worked out tremendously. And yes. you first felt like you were at least doing okay when you bought that property. Yeah. And what it, I was trying to get at earlier was uh, the active income of that year when you bought that property. How much was your active income? Oh, probably $25,000. $25,000. Maybe thirty. Yeah. And then how much did you make from that property in appreciation and the work that you put into that property? Like over what time period? Uh, over, over a year. Or how uh, long did it take? Uh, $75,000 in equity. Um, first year of rental income was $12,000. That's uh, a really good income. Oh, it was great. $1,000 a month, a month when you're making uh, twenty five grand a year? Yeah. Holy mackerel. Yeah. And how long did it take for you to actually complete that process with that house? Uh, four months. Four months, yeah. So in four months, mm -hmm. you made, I guess, what was that, $75,000? Yeah, in equity. In yeah. equity, right? Equity, when yeah. you were used to making $25,000 a year yeah. with active yeah. income. Also yeah. a good time to buy, Working though. full-time. It was, but the big thing is, it's like, I, it's not that, it, I, to me, I'm more of the, the mindset, there's always a good time to buy as long as you pre-qualify your right house, the right property. I have a, a, some of my family, they bought at rental in the absolute technical peak of the central Ohio market, which was April, 2007. They never lost money on it. Yeah, their equity got wiped out, but it was cash flowing 300 bucks a month through the entirety of the downturn and the foreclosure crisis. And Still making that three hundred dollars a month. They've never raised the rent on their tenant. The tenant's been in there uh, starting probably two thousand nine. So wow, fourteen years, yeah. they've been making that three hundred dollars a month. And you know, I, I had helped that family member get a place. I was like, oh, I got to get one of these two. But uh, they did it through uh, subprime all day financing. You know, liar loans. We just signed a piece of paper. It's like boom, you get a you get a mortgage. Wow. Yeah, and that dried up in late oh seven, early oh eight. And what are your thoughts on the current market? I'm curious because I'm at the point now where my goal was to buy a house this year, but I, I, I don't know if it's going to happen. My goal was to actually buy a house last year, but it yeah. definitely didn't happen. I, I was so scared of the market and I had people like Graham and people like my dad that were like, you know, you should hold off for right now. It seems like that, you know, the rates are high and the prices haven't really adjusted for the higher rates and prices were starting to decline. And I know a lot of viewers are probably in my shoes right now where yeah. like buying a house is still a no joke investment for me. Like that's yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. And I don't want to like, that could be a crucial error if I make the wrong you know purchase at least timing wise what do you think about the, the market I, yeah i mean the it, well number one real estate's local i'm not from las vegas i'm from the columbus ohio market our market prices have not gone down hardly at all uh december was i think the best december we've ever had in history in terms of volume no appreciation or no still appreciation from december 2021 but flat compared to October, November. Um, I, I, I keep pulling MLS data because I still have my license mm -hmm. and I go get, get, get it right off the market. And it's our markets in Ohio is still very strong. But then again, we got a $100 million Intel chip plant coming to town. And it's just, that's going to keep my market strong. If I was in Phoenix, Arizona with the TSMC plant, I probably wouldn't be too gun shy about it. I don't know about the Las Vegas market and what your employment drivers are and you know, is it casino and hospitality heavy? If if the casinos make a lion's share of income over there, then ah, it might hold off. If I wanted to buy in Austin, Texas, yeah, prices have gone down a decent bit. But then again, you've got Disney building, you've got uh, Tesla building, you've got other, I was thinking they, they were talking about a chip. Some other company was talking about a chip fab, maybe Samsung. But there's other drivers potentially of employment in the central Texas area. And with their business climate, I'm like, ah, I, I wouldn't be super bearish on buying there. If I wanted to buy like in Los Angeles or San Bernardino or Orange County, I'm like, oh, Grant, I don't know what their, their, their economy drivers are, but I would probably be really careful in those areas. And then, there, you know, there's so many sub markets in the okay. United States. I worry in Vegas, and you've seen this, when you drive around the amount of construction right now, yeah. it is absurd. So many units, like just as you're driving in on the 15, there are thousands of units and they get finished like every week. Every so you think time. the supply is going to climb too fast? Oh yeah. There's so much under construction right now and they're not going to pause the mid, I mean, so if they could afford to pause mid construction, yeah. just wait. Like I think Toll Brothers is one of those where mm. they could just choose now, nah, you know, we're not going to build right now. We'll yeah. return later. They could afford to do that. A lot of these other builders, they have loans, they have, um, you know, deadlines that they have to meet. They have to get them built. And 
it might take a bit of a loss on some of that. I don't know. They might offer really crazy concessions. So if, if you're talking about for a rental, I just think there's so much new supply coming in the market. I think rents have to drop yeah. substantially. I, and, and once again, real estate's local in Columbus, <clears throat> right. Ohio. They've just, there's not enough houses being built right now. They just cannot get them built. And I've got developers in my part. I live 20 miles south of uh, downtown Col well, Columbus area-ish. And uh, they're fighting now. There's three separate develop developers trying to build four to 500 home subdivisions in my, my local community. And they're go and we're having zoning meetings and stuff mm -hmm. every couple weeks, it seems, because they've got to build more houses. So once again, real estate's local. So from, for people not from yeah. Southern Ohio or yeah. Vegas or LA yeah. or the other places we've discussed, what are some of the biggest indicators that you look for, yeah. let's say, if, if you're these random people, like what advice would you give to them to look for? Job growth. There's a lot. I'm trying to think of what agency in the federal government, um, it's not Case Schiller, but it's somebody else. They have a heat map, a really good heat map of what markets are going to appreciate, what markets are going to appreciate. And they had different uh, pro, uh, interest rate scenarios, different employment scenarios. And I, I would want to find a place, place with good job growth. I also wouldn't want to see a place that climbed in value obscenely over coronavirus, because unless there was a lot of job growth, then it's kind of built on just cheap interest, cheap, cheap money. In that case, where they're pulling the cheap money off the market, you're probably going to come down. But then there's also a lot of repositioning in the United States, which to me, I would have a little more faith in Vegas than I would other markets. Um, so I would want to see job growth over the past, you know, two years. I'd want to see, you know, maybe some rising household incomes, some migration to that area. And then the other thing I wanted to say, too, is I... I I really feel like if you're in any market, you could make a deal, meaning you don't have to go out and buy a new build home off of a builder. You could find something that's a little run down. You could find a house that needs a little bit of work. The markets I'm in, it just seems to me that a lot of people, especially especially owner occupants, they there's a decent bit of discount on properties still if you can go in and do a little bit of work. That would be a good opportunity for you, Jack. Waiting, just imagine waiting like four to six months, seven months, kind of for the market to settle a little bit. Find a dump. Yeah. You could go in and spend maybe like 30, 40 grand just renovating it. That would be a fun project. Yeah. It's going to drive Good content. You, would drive you crazy, though. You think so? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh. I would be nervous to like split the, any of my focus. From you, yeah, you buy yourself, I want to say, a full time job for probably four months. That would be, it's a lot. Expensive. You will be there every day, guarantee it. Yeah. Mm. But you could learn to manage other people. That's true. And you get experience in real estate. You get the content. And I think it might make you just a better investor. So some good advice. I'll definitely think about that. Let's talk about your portfolio right now. Sure. Because like we've mentioned, yeah. it's comprised of a bunch of different businesses. Can we yeah. talk about ass or I guess like the, the ass. worth assets, I was going to say. <laughs> but like I, I, I should have said like, you know, uh, if we're drawing a pie of your net worth, yeah. what uh, what do the pieces look like? Do we want to do social media too or? No. Well, you can't, I, like a valuation of a YouTube I get channel. It. No, yeah. I probably I get it. do that. That's yeah. fine. Because it's like one of those things. I want to be transparent with people, but then I don't also want to overload numbers. Mm -hmm. So like real estate-ish, uh, six, seven million-ish. Mm -hmm. um, laundromat. The, the car wash, we're doing really good. I'm hoping for like a two or 2.2 2 million valuation on it soon. Um, we're in the process. I want to, what I was on the last one, we were talking about how we were just in the process and just got a new car wash rebuilt. We're just probably a third through the renovations. We'll end all renovations February. So we'll, this February, so in a month, -ish, I don't know when the video will drop, but like we'll end up uh, that I'm shooting for like a two to $2.2 .2 million valuation in, in this market for it. Um, laundromats and vending machines and everything else. Um, then, then that probably just everything else is a million dollars for, it's still almost it's like nearly 10, 10, 10 million ish, 10 million. Yeah. And then I, I owe probably $2.5 million to banks and debt and everything That's not like bad that. At all. That's no, it sounds like a, it's just like a $7.5 million net worth if you want to do those numbers. So, and what about income? Can we talk about income? Yeah. It's really hard because I spend so much, I spent so much money on my YouTube channel this year or last year, 2022, and I spent so much money on redoing my portfolio. The rental business, my whole real estate thing, because we started flipping some of my rentals into probably 1.3, 1.4 million. Last year, gross not net. If we would take the income, like what should Brandon have put in his pocket 
of the 1.3, 1. 1.4, 1. 1.4 million, I probably cleared $400,000 last year, but then I just turned it right over and put it back in more properties or upgrading other ones. So mm -hmm. it was a lot less than that. Then all my uh, small businesses and stuff together. I'll give you the together number because I don't want to, I've got an NDA on the car wash, so I still can't talk about my gross and net on it because I respect my business partner. He's a great guy. Um, but we'll lump all the other business income in together. Um, it probably did for fifty five hundred thousand dollars in my vending machines, car wash, laundromats, got other little small side hustles that I might do, do little funny videos on. So that puts me at the, uh, no, well, basically, oh, well, that, that puts me at like 1.8 million gross. Oh yeah. And then the nets, the nets probably 500 there. And did you include YouTube on that? No, YouTube last year was a hair over $500,000. So, um, but I, I, I haven't done my YouTube numbers yet to figure out what that net was because I've been spending so much money on cameras, crew, mm -hmm. infrastructure. I've got a video studio now. Um, I started doing a lot of coaching and training in the background with people. Mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of money on that. I never thought. I'd mentioned about it, kind of looking towards making, trying to figure out how do I help people. Um, last time and I was like, oh, just make a course and I'll just put it out there and everybody will love it. And, and it's like, oh no, that costs a lot of money. So I spent a lot of money on that. Um, but it's, that comes out from the, the $500,000 social media money too. What I find to be pretty cool is that you've consistently been able to just put out profitable businesses like the car wash, the it's, laundromat, you have vending machines, you did that yeah, paintball thing when you were a yeah. kid, real estate, but YouTube. Well, the, well, the, 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 the mobile paintball business failed. We had, but it, the, the other business. Oh, yeah. They're flipping, repairing paintball right. guns. It it was successful, but eventually it failed. I had a website business that I rolled up and I sold for $50,000 in 2012 ish. But then I had two or three other little website businesses that I don't talk about a ton. And they failed. And that's when I say that 2010, 2009, uh, 10, 11, 12 ish were really tough. They were really tough. Mm -hmm. We had two kids. Um, I had a website business, real estate income was doing bad. Like, did I ever really, was I really ever super successful as a real estate agent doing sales? Eh, not really. I might've made, my AGI on that might've been 20,000 a year after all my bills are paid. Mm. That's not really that great. Um, so it's like, I, it, all my profitable business get all this attention. And then I do put content out about the ones that failed and they do really poorly. So I love doing podcast. I love talking to people because then it's longer format and I can actually say, yeah, I had a paintball business and I made $40 over fixing people's equipment that would mail in and I would flip it. And then in this other box, other thing, I made three bucks an hour traveling all over Southern Ohio. And I was too stupid to understand the difference between those two. Stupid me. I bought a laundromat without doing two laundromats without doing due diligence from a guy who lied to me and we had an electric system explode. Um, you know, uh, and I, having said that, my win ratio on these businesses is definitely getting better. Laundromat, I bought in April 2019, my successful one. And now I bought it. We're doing $8,000 a month. I'm on a clear pathway to $15,000 a month. So at over three years from that point to this point, it's great. When I went and bought my car washes, we're profitable from day one because I knew what to mm. look like, look at from a cash-based business that required a lot of work. I took a partner on with that one that could fix things rather than me trying to fix it. He knows the difference. He knows how to crimp a copper pipe right. And he he's a great guy and knows how to fix soap tanks and do all sorts of crazy things. So I'm getting better at these businesses. They're becoming way more profitable. And for me, what I'm trying to do is just be transparent and honest and show people the process. So with all of the failures and successes that you've had in business, yeah. it's safe to say you're pretty experienced, right? I, I I would say that, but I find out every week there's I have a new life experience. What's that, last week's life experience? Uh, digging around, digging out a dead bird from a soap tank at my car wash. It's on my Instagram. How, how did that happen? What is a soap tank? So there's a, we have a mixing system in our car wash. Someone left the top of it up. And um, like an um, employee, employee did. Yeah. And uh, some bird got in our mechanical room, like maybe it flew in when mm. someone propped the door open so they could bring in bags of salt for the softener or they're bringing in a drum of soap or who knows what. And it could have nested up there and it fell in an open soap tank with water. It no. probably went in there thinking it was water. Probably. I drink so. and it, then maybe just, yeah, it yeah. was a soap tank, but it was the clear 
tire shine, I think. So I was like, oh gosh, like, do I really want to do this? I thought, well, I'll put it on Instagram and I'll show people that I still do this crap. <laughs> so I reached down the tech pod. Oh, what's your experience been like running a, a car wash? I, I really enjoy it. It with laundromats, you deal with a low end clientele most of the time who are struggling to pay their bills. And I, I spent a lot of time in a laundromat, you know, talking to people. We did like a, um, we did, we really tried to click baby video and it didn't do as well as I wanted. We filled my, um, vending machine full of money. So you go up to the vending machine. I had hundred dollar bills in there. So for a dollar, you could get a hundred bucks back. I was trying to try to do a Mr. Beast de deal. I had a company sponsor me. They gave me a bunch of money. It was like, oh, we're going to do that. Super cool. And my crew was there and I would come over to them and I would say, hey, what do you think of this? And they were like, this, this can't be real. I was like, I, sh I sh you know, I whisper in the ear. I'm like, I should, I'm sh I shoot content for YouTube. It's free money. Just get it. And then half the people just broke down and were crying and they would give me these stories of what was going on with like, oh, I, we came in to do our laundry because we live in a car. I'm like, Oh gosh, that breaks my heart. And then I'd have, I hear these stories all the time and you know, I get to feature some of them, some cool stories from a lot of men. But then the car wash, it's all mid to high level clientele. I have people coming in with Rolls Royces. Mm. Like where'd you find this thing? It was a 1980 silver spur edition Rolls Royce. They're not terribly expensive. They're not, but it's a cool car. It's a great car, great but car. they're cheaper than a Toyota Prius. It's just the maintenance could be a lot. I get it. Yeah, yeah. But it was is cool, all leather and stuff. And I see stuff like that. We got several guys in town with Porsches and hiring Corvettes. I think we got a guy with an R8 in town. Yeah. And he comes to use my car wash. I take pictures of their cars. I got a guy with a really nice Hellcat too. I'm like, oh, cool, Southern Ohio cars. That's nice. And so I, it's a different world. I'm dealing with a mid to high level client that I have mid to high level problems. Some lady swiped her credit card and it didn't charge it properly. So she was bad mouthing me on facebook because the credit card swiper didn't take or something silly like that mm -hmm. there's problems with it but then the i get a deal with a different clientele and then with real estate you know as i move to these higher end properties and deal with some doctors and nurses and I hear stories from my manager because the I mean, last time in this time i think i don't think i have my manager so i got a girl uh that's a manager and like personal assistant she sits and helps and assists my clients because i've got to step away from the real estate stuff too um, just because the day-to-day -day stuff and that's helping me with my portfolio reposition selling off my low-end stuff getting mm -hmm. higher end stuff so how much time do you spend at the car wash i'm on a mandated thing four to five hours a week for my partner i just said we, i'm going to buy this and i'm going to help you four hours a week and my youtube content was doing good but now i mean my content has continued to do good but i'm at an inflection point with my brand i'm like what is my channel is it physical side hustles where I go out and I'm like showing people how I restock vending machines and stuff like that. And I want to try to stay honest and true. I'm like, cause I don't stock that anymore. I have a girl, I pay 20 bucks a week and she stocks it for me. Am I in the, the car wash refilling soap all the time? Yes, I am currently because I signed a car. I agreed with my business partner that I would do that. And I'm trying to stay honest and true with him. And now it's like, okay, well, I could buy out that contract and I could, or I could sell the car washes and I could go do something else. I'm trying to figure out what the next time looks like. And I'm, I'm at a point I've got to start buying my time back, which for me, I'm getting a better brand focus. I'm like, okay, now I need to show me buying my time back and showing them that I've been, these aren't jobs. I mean, they're not jobs um, because I don't have to be there. I want to be there. I want to produce some content, but I'm also getting equity. I'm getting um, resid some residual income. Um, I don't see I feel like your audience isn't at the point of buying back their time like the people who are watching your videos are the type to be beginner yeah want to do the things that yeah. get them to the spot yeah. where they could even own something and then to show that like okay here's how I'm buying my time back is too advanced to advance for most yeah. people to comprehend when they're at the like when they're trying to get to step one and you're yeah. at step 10 you're like let me show you how to get to step 11 yeah pay this person to do that it's I feel like that step zero to five is like the most impactful yeah. for people that want to like make that change and make that difference. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to disagree yeah. with you, but I'm also trying to figure out how do I present that to people when it's not what I'm doing. I, I've, you know, my vending machines are making three or $4,000 a month. I mean, that's cool. I mean, that's life changing money for so many people out there. I know, you know, when I had the paintball business, an extra 500 bucks a month, man, I would have killed for that back then, especially, especially when I was working at the warehouse and mm -hmm. I was, yeah, even more 500 bucks a month back then, 11, 25 an hour. But it's also, how do I present that to my subscribers? Even though that's not something you know I, what do I would anymore. do teach somebody else how to do that. 
and document that. I think that would yeah. be so cool to take someone who's uh, you know eighteen to twenty five. That's a good idea. Has ten grand saved up yeah. for five grand, and you walk through with them and you film it. Yeah. Going from nothing to I don't know a hundred dollars a week yeah. or something like that, like five hundred a month would be insane. Yeah. And then you get to see the difference of the work that you do. Yeah. And showing somebody how to do that, like seeing the excitement. Yeah, that's a good idea. I guess I'm trying to do that with Noah that's out there. He's an intern. I started, I got my video studio is actually at a college. So I've been kind of working with the business school out there to try to find people that are somewhat talented. I'm, I'm, I'm really having a problem finding good talent with people. Um, I've, I've got, I, my, my team keeps getting better and better and better. But every so often, pretty often, I've had people throw me curveballs. I'm like, okay, I got to make sure the people that I'm partnering with are good. And then I need to make sure they're local and I need to make sure they're, they're honest and trustworthy and true. Because there are people that I've been helping in the background in my community with vending machines. I bought one kit. Well, and this, this will never be posted. Like, I'll never go into that. I'm like, bought a kid, a couple vending machines. I said, I will do some cold calling for you. We documented the cold calling. They never placed them which I guess that'd be a good video. But once again, I'm from rural Ohio. Do I really want to post a video about a kid that I tried to help? Went out, bought him two vending machines, went through the whole process, did cold calling, identified a couple locations he could place and he never went and got it done. Do I post a video on social media and run the kid down? Probably not. No, yeah. I mean, what good is going to come from that? I don't, yeah. I don't think anything's good, good going to come from it. I've never mentioned that before other than here. So Graham Steph and Ice Coffee Hour exclusive. It's exclusive. Yeah, it's exclusive. Oh. So it's like, how does that work? Well, then I've got to iterate and build my process down on helping other people. What That's exactly what I'm trying to do with some laundromat guys that I'm coaching and training and we're texting back and night, back and forth almost every night and presenting offers and things. And I'm really enjoying doing that level of help. And um, we just, um, I think we're going to do a video project out in Georgia here real soon where I've, I've been coaching this guy back and forth for six months now. He was, he was telling me he's so excited. He sent in, he had an accepted offer on a laundromat and it's a dump. It's worse than mine. And I told him, I said, you know what? If when you buy it, your first laundromat and after I've coached and trained you, I said, I'm bringing my film team out and I want to just sit there with you for the first three days. And I'm going to go with you over everything you need to fix this laundromat up and I'll help. And we'll just film the whole flipping thing with my crew. And cause we've already got all the documentation for him sending in letters of intent. He's gone through eight, like 12 laundromats looking at it. That's where I'm wanting to take my brand because then it, it's less about me and my businesses and it's more about other people and how can I provide value yeah. to them. So how would you start? Let's just say you're, I don't know, 18 to 25, 18 to 30, and you want to make an extra $1,000 a month. $1,000 a month? Yeah. No, we got to make it more appetizing than that. No, I think 1000 um, a month is is both realistic. For an 18 to 20 year old? Yes. You're, I you're think that's high school? great. Yeah. yeah. You think that's little? I think, I think in high school, sure, 1000 bucks a month. No. Out of high school? Yeah. No, it's a, a side hustle. Uh, it's really good money. A thousand dollars a month for a side hustle, Jack. I guess There's, it depends on where you live. Jack's yeah, head it is depends in the on clouds. Where, it depends on where you live and how how low income you are. Five hundred dollars a month is life changing money for yeah. somebody that's making clear, like bringing in sixteen hundred a month at McDonald's. So I mean, like I always like to try to define these things a little bit better. But if I was like a eighteen year old kid fresh out of college or fresh out of high school, and I'm like I'm looking at maybe going to college, I've got a job, or maybe I'm not got a job, I would get a job. I would, number one, start doing broad range of stocks, VTI, VOO. Um, just find one of those things, and I would start really researching, are there any vending machine opportunities? And this isn't an org, un, and this is not a organized list. Mm. You know, your results may vary. I can issue a disclosure. Um, look at vending machines. Can I find some locations for vending machines? Can I find some cheap vending machines on Facebook Marketplace? That's usually my place, but... Once again, we got the, the Cody Sanchez problem. I mentioned that in videos and all vending machines disappear mm. <laughs> on the marketplace. But usually if you wait, wait it out a couple of weeks, um, you can find one decent. Can I find any locations to put a snack machine or a vending machine? Well, that's 800 bucks. You should be able to make a couple hundred bucks. Um, it, am I tech savvy? Um, do I like technology? I run a lot of guys that they're very passionate about phones and stuff. I like, I really like rebuilding cell phones and computers and stuff, not building gaming computers. If I had a dollar for everybody that asked me that, because once again, we're still 18 year old kid. Mm -hmm. Um, 
man, I know a lot of kids that could do a physical side hustle, non-passive, 50 bucks an hour doing cell phones. So you work 10 hours a month on fixing other people's cell phones. It's not really high end. It's not really technically complicated, but if you're passionate about technology, if it comes real easy, 10 hours a, 10 hours a month, that's an extra 500 bucks. And it's scalable at that way. Um, I mentioned this in one video, and I'm not telling everybody and their brother to do it, but we talked about laundry drop-off. I've got this kid um, who watched my TikTok, it TikToks, and I mentioned, you know, just be creative when it starts. A, you start a business. You know you could do laundry, a laundry drop-off service without having any business of your own, like no laundromat of your own. You just cut a deal with a laundromat owner. Ask for a cheaper usage of their laundromat. And he f sent me an email. And he's like, oh, I watched a video you posted. I'm like, I posted that video two years ago. And he's like, I'm trying to buy a laundromat now because me and my college friends are making $7,500 to $8,000 extra a month. And they're using too many machines in the laundromat. And they're trying to get kicked out. So like, how do I take this money and put it in the laundromat? Wow. So, like, so they don't have to have any of their own equipment. Mm -hmm. They just say, we'll do the laundry, the labor. Yeah, the get labor. it all ready and we'll take a split of what you yeah. bring in. Yeah. And, wow. And, and doing all this, I would, um, I would build a brand. So if you want to fix cell phones, it's time for you to learn to make a Facebook page. You want to do vending machine place placement? Learn how to do an email signature and build a Facebook page for your vending machine. Learn, cross train and learn how the business world works. And then, you know, um, I still want to turn people away from buying, seeing if you can do a house hack. What's the scariest moment you've had at one of your own laundromats? Uh, my laundromats are the company, period. The company? I had to pull a gun on somebody. You had to pull a gun on somebody. Why? Park. Um, there was a rumor that there was a guy that had murdered somebody and he was squatting in one of my trailers. And the videos actually, I mean, the videos on YouTube, but I edited everything out. And I'm like, you know, it might have been better to post it on the internet. I don't, well, no, no. The reason I didn't post it was because I was still worried about the guy. I went and did a mm -hmm. video, and that's when I filmed 99% of my stuff with a cell phone. And I was doing the, hey, it's Brandon with Investment Joy selfie. And there was a guy's legs in a room. And I didn't go, I, I do walkthroughs all my houses before I film now. Like I make sure the location's secure before I turn the camera on. And uh, I didn't do it that time. That was a bad mistake. So I, I turned around and I saw legs. And I'm like, what the crap? And I look and there's like window in the trailer smashed out, blood across the wall. Oh. And he gets up. I'm like, hello, sir. He's like, don't mind me. I'll leave. And I got to look at his face and it's the guy. They said, you know, he's got a murder warrant in Kentucky. I'm like, whoa, crap. So I do my thing. I Pull the gun on my holster, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go. And I got the, the camera. I, I don't know if it was recording at that time. I know I've got video through that incident. And I'm like, you need to leave my trailer park right now. Just just get out of here. I don't care where you go. Never want to see you here again. And, you know, he's a very violent guy. And he's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, you know, bud, I feel for you. Um, but this is my trailer park. He can't live here. You're not paying rent. I can't rent anything to you. I wish you best of luck, but you've got to leave. Um, you know, everybody from my company knows I'm here. And if you don't leave within two minutes, I'll call the cops. And you, do, we both know you don't want me to do that right now. And he walked off and we still dealt with that guy a couple times, but not in that capacity. So that's been weird, but that was 2019. That's pre coronavirus. That's pre wow. YouTube fame and stuff like that. So it's like, okay, ever since then it's like, okay, I need to be, worried about that a little bit more but i try and be you know it's a refining process i try to get a little better a little better a little better do you always carry most of the time yeah okay it's a crazy situation <laughs> it's 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 I, life for yeah, a but lot you, of people have you ever considered like wearing a bulletproof vest or like just something where it's you know it it's could, impenetrable yeah. or bulletproof vests aren't impenetrable i mean if someone pulls like a like a knife or something like that yeah maybe wear something that I mean, to me, case, to me, no? here's the thing. To me, if it's that bad, it's probably time for me to hang it up because I've got a wife and five kids. Right. But it's right. it's also one of those things where I also feel on the other end, I really need to document this process in my life and going on, um, just just going through the process. It's important because, you know, a lot of people that, I've got a lot of kids in the ghetto and they're like, you don't know what it's like to live up in this environment. You know, people getting shot every day. I'm like, yeah, you know, 
I've been in some tough times too, and it allows me on at least one level to connect with some of my subscribers that aren't in a traditional life situation. And I, I feel like it's important. I feel like I can talk about it as time goes on, as my brand gets bigger and better, that I can go back and reflect and talk about the stories and talk about the bad times, the good times, how much money I've made, how much money I haven't made, how successful my businesses are or have been, how unsuccessful they are. And I'm just trying to craft stories around these different situations and, you know, trying to make the best of it. Cause I think there's always value in positive and negative situations. Kind of defines a person, you know, how did you respond to this thing? Well, didn't respond to the paintball company very good when we were making three bucks an hour. He didn't iterate and improve it. That went bankrupt or closed down or whatever. It's just, you know, uh, it is what it is, but I'm very thankful for this. You know, feel thankful, feel blessed for this point in life with my social media, um, brand i've met some people that you know they're like you changed my life i watched that video and like i have one video like 3500 people watched back in 2019 where i was just talking about it doesn't matter where you are where you live whether you're in la or the deep south you can make a difference of your own life you like you can change the situation you're in and i would encourage you i'm not telling you what to do i'd, I'd like you to consider starting a business or developing a business mindset in everything you do. And this, this guy, um, this adult now, said, oh, that just changed my life because I was in college for some crazy degree that had no future. And he said, and it was it was something in the arts. And he said, it's not that I, um, I, 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 you, you, that I took your advice as, oh, you hate arts. I'm like, I didn't say that in the video, which he, he, under, he got that out of it. And he said, but I changed my major so I'd had an art degree, but I, changed, I majored in business immediately. And I was like, okay, cool. And he said, so the first thing I did as a business school project is I started developing a brand. And um, they ended up, by the time he got out of college, they got acquired. Hmm. I was like, oh, dang it. That's cool. And I'm like, well, how much did you guys get acquired for? Because it was a decent sized brand. Somebody that kind of heard of. I was like, is it more than $5 million or less than $5 million? He said, I can't say exactly. I said more than five million. The kid shakes his head. And I'm like, wow. Yeah, that's nice for a video that I felt disappointed on. No one watched. Thirty five hundred views. Thirty five hundred views in twenty nineteen. See, I'm always surprised by who listens to these podcasts. Like sometimes I get DMs from the most random people. Yeah. Can it have. blows my mind. I got, just got a guy, and um, he's like, "Oh, I'd love for you to help me with real estate." I said, "I do. I do training, coaching. I'm like, I'll give you it for free. Just do it." He's in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got another guy and he was, he's kind of not a major character, but he's a minor character on stranger things. Like everybody. Loved. Really? Yes. Oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you off camera. Okay. Um, really nice guy. And he's, he, he's been texting me while I've been in Vegas because he was like, oh, I got a real estate deal and there's some, some distress situations there. He's such a sweet guy. Such a cool guy. What is this world I'm in? That's so cool. That is yeah. Crazy. And I'm like, what? world am i in that people would have any they pay any attention to this guy that's never gone to college i'm from southern ohio grew up poor and i've just been trying trying my best and i'm you know i i fail on a lot of things and i watch there i've watched plenty of videos like, oh that's a stupid video why did they publish it oh man we could have done a better thumbnail and i'm like but man i'm having some sort of positive impact on the world and i'm like i need to keep doing it um trying to keep myself safe but i'm also trying not to live a lifestyle where i insulate myself from everything that happens and you know, maybe maybe I'll die on camera and get a lot of clicks, or maybe I'll just keep keep going on and everything will be fine. I am trying to be cautious though. Yeah. I got a random question. Do you sure. think that it's easier to build wealth in rural areas or like the Midwest, or do you think in wealthier areas like high density uh, places like LA? I think it's like totally that? equal. You think it's perfectly? I equal? I think it's perfectly equal. I think it's just fifty fifty, and I think it, the problem is. The problem is with the Midwest and rural America is it's hard to find local mentors easily because there's not an easy brain trust that you can find super quickly. I mean, there's a method to it. I'm big on good old boys clubs like the Masons or the Eagles or the Moose or Odd Fellows or fraternal organizations for old people. Like, I, I love those things. Um, I love those types of groups in the Midwest. When you go to a place like LA, you could find, you know, they got these incubator meetings. I know I've seen some like NFT meetups here in Vegas and I've seen the people that go to them. I'm like, man, those are really cool places. They're big and they're advertised. The, uh, uh, the opportunity to 
get a job here and make a lot of money quick is very, very big. The opportunity in the Midwest to buy a company from a dying owner quickly and easily, or you can go and you can buy cheap real estate. And it's just, I, I don't ever want anybody uh, that watches my content to say, this is what I have to do. This is, this is how it has to be. You know, this, you, this, you, you, need, you need to go and buy a vending machine right now. Because realistically, it's, you know, you can get a vending machine and not make a bunch of money off of it. Now, I like it because it insulates you because you can wait to, you know, just resell a vending machine for the 800 bucks you have in it. But I, I just feel, I t meet so many successful people from the Midwest and they do, they've done well. And people, plenty of people from California that do well. Um, and, you know, it's just, I think it's just, you have to have a different mindset. You have to understand the market just a little bit different. But I think anybody can be successful in where you are. What do you think, Graham? Um, I think big cities, you, you're exposed to so many other people. I think that helps. Yeah. From what I've seen, the, the smaller towns and cities, um, people tend to think the same way. And I think bigger cities, you, you could break beyond that easier. And at least for, for me in L.A., like just seeing, because you have such a disparity of wealth in L.A., uh, you go like one side of the 10 freeway and all the houses are a quarter of the prices going like a mile you know, the other side of the 10 freeway, west of it, um, not west, north. Um, I think just seeing that you're able to kind of pick and choose from those areas and those those, those uh, businesses. So I think that that helps is just being around it. Right. Yeah. You don't really get quite that elsewhere. Yeah. But for me, it's also just a different. I would, I would say that... Um, I would say based on the knowledge base and the current thing that everything works, it's probably slightly easier in a bigger city. Um, but as time goes on, especially with social media and the knowledge that's on YouTube, lo I love YouTube to death. Yeah. And it's becoming very easy to become very wealthy in rural America mm -hmm. because that, that knowledge base, it just gets easier and easier. I agree. I know some of the, the best businesses that you can get into or the best like jobs that you can get into mm. at a young age with little experience are mm. done on a laptop anyways. Yeah. So it's better definitely if you're doing those sorts of jobs to live in cheaper areas where you can do some yeah. something with your money rather than like in some part of LA where if you want to get a starter home, it's like one and a half million dollars. Yeah. The, the strategy has to be different. Mm -hmm. and that's why I'm like, I'm, not, I'm not telling you to get vending machines in downtown LA I probably would look at something a little bit different and a house hack is going to be very, very difficult. But you know what? I got a guy in Orange County I know that bought a vending machine route from a retiring owner who just couldn't deal anymore. He's doing 175K gross, 95K net, and he bought it for $80,000. No. Yeah, in Orange County. Really? Yeah. That's, that's, great, that's really good. That is yeah, great. Great business. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's so cool to yeah. be doing. Like, I always think the idea of vending machines is so nice. You literally yeah. walk up with some food, you put it inside. Yeah. Sure, maybe you need to make repairs. Yeah. And then you just collect money. That sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's, it, it's great. And there's 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 a lot of upside to it. And there's a lot of, we just did videos on one of the Las Vegas's largest ATM mm -hmm. guy. That's a cool business. And he was also one of the largest massage chair guys. And I never would have thought. Okay, wait, tell us about this. Massage chairs? You ever go to... Um, uh, go oh, through an airport yes yeah. and someone's sitting there they just dropped a $20 bill I, I at one time I heard he had most of those in air, airports and uh, I always thought those were owned by the airport I don't think so I, I think he's the guy that has a bunch of them but he started he started rattling off some locations here in Vegas that he had uh, massage chairs and ATMs and I think we're going to do a video on them pull like a a standard investment joy video. Yeah. So for an ATM, it's a reverse video. It's not pulling money from the location. It's putting 15 grand in. And then for the massage chair, um, they had a demo model that we were getting B-roll for. So they were like, oh, we got the nice light and we're doing high frame photography on it or vid high frame video. And we're get shooting all the B-roll and prep for tomorrow's video. And then they open it up and they get the the, cha the money cassette out and they pull it like, what, what, where's this money from? They pulled the cash. There's, I mean, it looked like there's 80 bucks in there. Mm. And they're like, this was never in use. Or this was like not supposed to be in use. And still somebody, it, it was sitting in an office, a commercial office here, real close to your, yeah. your place. And just from the business people transiting through a small office, it made like 75 to 100 bucks. That's crazy. Yeah, it was like, oh, we don't have to, 
they were because they had talked about uh, for this b-roll shop maybe we could take you know let's dump our wallets in there and see if we can put like 10 bucks in here just for b-roll with our lighting rig no everybody just looked at it like holy crap there's a lot of money in this thing Wow. And this is a testament to these silly business ideas where you're buying, you know, the guy that we did the videos with Aaron, he said, yeah, I love buying robot, robot employees that I got, you know, I think that he has 700 robot bank tellers, ATM machines, and he's got hundreds or dozens of robot masseuse, 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 whatever. He's got all these, all these, he's all these different businesses. Just so cool. Like, oh my gosh, as I get more into this industry and more people call me about saying, oh, you got to see how I'm making money today. And like the kid that watched me on TikTok and got some value in my business making you know, 7,500 bucks a month off folding other people's clothes. Like, oh my gosh, it's just, this world has so much opportunity and if you can solve other people's problems and if you can find a way to automate it, you make a lot of money off of it. Just, wow. Yeah. All right, fantastic. title of the video, how to build a seven figure business. In a month. In a month. Boom. 30 days. In 30 yeah. days. Building uh, a seven-figure business in 30 days. Yeah. yeah. Just got to listen to well, Brandon. Last question that I have is uh, you were mentioning earlier about hidden compartments. And sure. You find them all the time. I'm curious. I have found a lot. And the coolest one I ever did, and we're one day past, I, I, I set Chillicothe, Ohio, where my laundromat is, was on the um, Underground Railroad. I have found a, at least one compartment in a house where they were hiding r refugee slaves, and it was that was awesome. Wow! It was a it was a room in a closet in a closet, and I was like, "What the heck?" It was an old brick Victorian, and um, gosh, it was ten years ago, and uh, it was I was like, "Walk-in closet in a Victorian?" I was like, "They didn't have these," so I'm walking in, and I'm looking in this this closet. I'm like, "Man." And I'm like, look at it. There's a shoe compartment, like where they had a little shoe rack in it. Like these people in this house in 1850, it was like built in 1840. Like, man, these people were rich. And I'm looking in this cubby hole and I'm like, there's a, a, a little, um, a little piece of wood that you could just turn. I was like, Oh, I've seen this before. And it's like you could see where they could move the shoe rack over mm -hmm. it and whatever. You flip it in, and then it, the door just swung open. And you open up the door, and it's a compartment in Chillicothe. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like they, they had people here. That's been the coolest compartment I think I've ever seen. I was like, oh. Did you film it? No, this was... This Yeah. I say I do, I've documented everything since 2013. I, this is one I'm pretty sure I missed. Mm. I should probably go through my records a little more. But most of the ones that we talked about earlier, that's the coolest one. But then I also find a lot of drug compartments. People will um, they'll modify their ductwork in their house. They'll pull out their, their vents, and then they'll put, you know, they'll, they'll hide things in there on um, fishing line and stuff. And mm. You're looking at it like, oh, crap. That guy that I rented this house to that I just loved to death, and they're so kind and elderly, was hiding hiding substances here. And I've seen, you know, all these different mm -hmm. compartments and all these different things. You, The conversation we had was about a person that I think had modified cars with hidden compartments. I was like, that was cool growing up. You know, like a James Bond thing. Mm -hmm. But then when you realize what most people are dealing with, it's not near as interesting as James Bond movies. But... Um, like I, I've been in, I haven't run into too many cool houses like that. I remember one house in probably when I was doing BPOs, they wanted me to do a BPO in a house and uh, just going outside. And I'm like, it's a Cape Cod. I was doing my form. Cape Cod, go inside. Where's the second story? Go outside. There's a window out there. Go inside. Where's the access to it? Go outside. There's blinds in a chair. That lamp is antique. There's no access to the Cape Cod, the, the half story up top. And I go in the kitchen and I realize that they've drywalled and trimmed over the old staircase. Wow. Yeah. I was like, I can't, I can't modify this house. This is, I can't do that. So I'm a real yeah. estate agent. They paid me $65 dollars to go in tell them what the house is worth and all i could do was like check off the box possible cape cod here's the value with here's yeah. the value out. and i was like man that was one of those moments i was like man how cool would it be to be a real estate investor buy this house because if it was 
uh, interior BPO was a foreclosure. So I just didn't sure. have to, to tell them what to listen for. And I was like, man, I want to buy one of these houses and just go on treasure hunting. Um, the closest I've got to that on one of my own houses was I bought a house with a barn. The barn had a, uh, attic in it and you know, I'm working through this thing. I was like, I got one, I got one and I'm working through it and you can tell where the slats and the boards in the attic were so bad. The roof was old metal. You could see daylight or some, mm. some level of light. Hell, it took me a week to figure out. And I realized on that specific house that there was, it was a hayloft at one time. And, you know, with a hayloft, who cares about them? They're just going to bring a, a hay track up to it. You're going to push, push whatever up in there. And the only way to get it was through a ladder on the outside, paint it over, Little wood latch, just like the house that uh, was uh, underground mm-hmm. railroad house. Um, so I was looking at it, and I flipped that open. I, I haven't. You know, I, we had brought ladders to try to get in it, and before, and my crew took the ladders off. So I got on the hood of my, or got on the cab of my pickup truck I had at the mm-hmm. time. Very perched, very precariously, lifted it open, and it was full of like. Christmas decorations from oh, the fi- okay. from the fifties. Wow! Yeah, so there's an old antique sleigh in there, and just some other cool stuff. Yeah, that's pretty that's cool. neat. That's a little better than the drug it's compartments. It's like the really expensive version of Storage Wars, except yeah. you're buying a house. house. Yeah, I, I was like, if I get if I get really screw you money for you social media, that's what I want to do. So I was about make an offer on somebody's whole estate, sight unseen. I want to buy your farm for three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I don't care what's in it. I'll take it all. I've had offers like that in the past, but never when I've had money. Um, just uh, that'd be a cool series. Yeah. Just bring my team in. We find everything value, and we go in and we flip the house. That's cool. We figure out what all the contents are worth and what all the real estate's worth. That's what I'd like to do. But that's a two hundred and fifty, three hundred fifty thousand dollar video project, yeah. or probably more. Um, last time I had one offered, it was pre coronavirus, and even in the middle of nowhere, Ohio, our values have gone up a bit. So. I got a random question just to just to satisfy my curiosity. How many doors do you have? One thirty five right now. One hundred and thirty five. Yeah. Do you know what about you had last time we shot with you? Uh it was probably one thirty ish. So I've already started consolidation, selling the crappy units, mm. trading them up for better units. So I've probably bought six or seven much nicer ones and then sold off a dozen crappier ones. Mm. And when that, that those those sales are reflected in my one point four million ish that I did and did right. last year in total real estate volume. Got it. You good? Cool. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much oh, for coming you know what on. I'm not, Jack. Um, one other thing I want to mention is that you could get a free stock when you send it all to right, public.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really, when you really appreciate deposit, it. Gram. With that said, you guys, <laughs> until next time. Enjoy. Very cool, guys. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, yeah, man.